All right, so this is going to be the introduction to Wilfred Owen. <clears throat> um, uh, Wilfred Owen uh, was, lived from 1893 to 1918. Um, Owen is essentially, you know, known as the World War One poet, and that, that is real, and, and the poet, and maybe he's the greatest uh, all-time sort of a poet of, of the combat experience as, as, as well. Um, you know, and Owen was, he, he, you know, he, he, he was not somebody who maybe was ever, you know, very well designed to be a soldier. Um, he was, he was initially, he had moved, he was a devout Christian. He had, um, at some point, I think it was 19, was it around 1912 or something like that. Um, um, as a devout Christian, kind of moved to France because he was frustrated with the Christian Church. He was he was a very uh, kind of righteous guy, but a genuinely righteous guy. Uh, and, you know, moves to France because he doesn't think the British uh, clergymen uh, do enough for the underclasses um, and aren't really standing up for the people he thinks they ought to be standing up for. Um, when the war, uh, you know, World War One, you know, uh, begins in in I think nineteen fourteen, I guess um, he joins you know or he you know, kind of reluctantly joins he almost doesn't come back but then he does uh he does join up um, you know as an officer to the war and he you know it's not a great fit you know uh for him at first he was small he loved romantic poetry and again poetry was something he was thinking about uh, even before he was something he was sort of obsessed over always doing i don't know if he uh you know, I think he even thought about becoming a poet, which I guess was not as impossible then as it is today, um, you know, to earn your living at. But um, anyway, you know, you had this small, bookish, you know, kid who loved uh, romantic poetry. He didn't necessarily, you know, found his uh, fellow soldier sort of loutish. <clears throat> um, he, he was extremely close to his mother, you know, a bit of a mama's boy, too, on top of everything. Uh, else and it just you know for a while it, it just wasn't a, a great fit between him and he and his fellow soldiers however you know when the fighting does start uh, he proves himself quite brave actually in battle uh, many uh, many times and, and earns the respect uh, of his of, of his fellow soldiers um, across the war you know he suffered he, he you know Owen really suffers um, he's, he gets a concussion, he's injured several times, um, and, and really suffers a, a trauma. She, he has to leave the war for a while, but he, he does go back, uh, even after, after he didn't have to. Uh, meets Wilfred Sassoon, another great uh, poet, um, and this sort of, uh, you know, a meeting that kind of changes his life, and, and that uh, Owen decides uh, both for his fellow soldiers to go back uh, into the fight, even after, and again, he'd, he'd been the... Uh, uh, out of the war for a while after he, you know, after a bombing, and he woke up um, next to a uh, one of his fellow soldiers who was dead, like two or three days later. Had to pretend to be dead for a while. I guess the enemy uh, uh, soldiers were there, and then he sort of uh, got up and, and and kind of made his mis, you know his escape uh, with with I think severe injuries. Uh, he after you know again meeting Sassoon. Um, he decides he's going to be the poet. He, he, the, the World War One is too big a thing, um, and he's part of this. And to sort of as some more way of giving a meaning, or maybe combining, you know, uh, figuring out a way to get his love of poetry, you know, into it. He decides he's going to take World War One and kind of um, give it a poetic language, and that becomes sort of his mission in life. That and being there, I think, for his for his men. And um, again, a little about World War One, which is uh, what he's writing about. World War One was a time when I, you know, you, uh, basically the technological advancements uh, of the weaponry of the war um, really kind of went beyond uh, the general's ability to plan for it. Um, Gatling, you know, machine guns and Gatling guns and gas, as we'll uh, discover one of the, uh, one of the, one of the, you know, Dulcia de Corabest is maybe his greatest poem, which we'll do in a little bit, um, was... You know, prevalence, um, you know, air, you know, bombs being dropped from planes, you know, a lot of things that just hadn't happened before, 
and so this was war at, at, at a scale that maybe hadn't happened, and it was also uh, just slaughter, you know, and, and, and what could just seem like the most senseless slaughter at a scale that hadn't really been uh, ex experienced. And what happens is it breaks down into trench warfare, um, where, you know, you know the, the the two sides sort of dig trenches. Uh, there are, these trenches are usually you know, bu uh, above their heads. You have to kind of maybe even get on a ladder to kind of peek over. You have to be really careful about doing this. So you spy glasses and everything else. Otherwise, you get to, you, you, your snipers out there waiting to take your head off. Um, the trenches were a miserable place. Cold. They were always wet. You know, water collecting in them because they were dug. You know, the trenches were dug so deep, um, filled with rats. Um, tetanus uh to all kinds of you know uh trench you know you, you'd walk through these these things and oftentimes your 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 feet would get so cold they'd get numb uh and would also often pull right out of the boots you know um, as you were walking uh and oftentimes it took the soldier a while because his feet was so numb to realize his shoe had fallen off and by the time he realized he wouldn't be able to come, go back and get it um, and again, trench foot, uh, where you would, uh, you know, get gangrene, lose toes, sometimes lose your entire foot, uh, would have to be amputated, uh, was a very common, uh, maybe the most common, uh, injury for soldiers. And, you know, it, it, you know, it, it was just a miserable, I mean, hell on earth, it really was. In between, of course, uh, was no man's land, which was filled with barbed wire and, um, often dead so the you know the, the dead soldiers' bodies, uh, sort of uh, caught up in the wire. Oftentimes, to the the dead of your you know your brothers, you see, uh, the, your fellow soldiers, the dead would be piled on the edges like cordwood. Um, and so uh, even the disease that that can come uh, from decaying bodies was there. The smell of death, all you know, was just always there. Um, so this was a. You know, it was a hellish uh, as, as a sort of landscape that you had to... And again, the, uh, Owen wanted to take this and uh, give this all sort of a poetic voice. He was known for sort of a assonance, which is where you sort of... Uh, you don't rhyme the vowels, but you sort of match uh, the consonant uh, letters. Um, and uh, sort of para-rhyme, which are rhymes without... You know, almost rhymes, but not rhyming. And he played with all this kind of language, even though he had a, he had a gorgeous ear. I mean, r romantic poetry, which is the most melodious gorgeous lyrical sort of uh, uh, language was his favorite and so he kind of took that and played with it and, and, and broke it up in ways that it'd, it'd be really rough on the ear sometimes and seemed to sort of match you know a world that maybe didn't make sense you know anymore and uh the violence and and carnage uh, of, of the world he was trying to uh, represent through his poetry uh so anyway that is wilfred owen and uh we will uh, uh do the poems next